Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, a special edition of the Berman Institute seminar series. I'm absolutely delighted to um, welcome our speaker, Dr. Tony Hatch. He's the William Allen Nielsen Professor at Smith College where he's visiting this year and is Professor of Science and Society at Wesleyan University, where he's also affiliated faculty in the Department of African American Studies, the College of Envi the Environment, and the Department of Sociology. He's the author of both Silent Cells, The Secret Drugging of Captive America, and Captive. <laughs> I have a Marvel obsessed child. Um, <laughs> captive America. Uh, and Blood Sugar, Racial Pharmacology and Food Justice in Black America. Uh, he earned his uh, AB in philosophy from Dartmouth and importantly, uh, his master's and PhD in sociology from here in Maryland at, um, not at Hopkins, but we'll forgive him for that, at the University of Maryland at Collin Park. I know Tony because we're both members of a National Academy of Medicine ad, ad hoc committee um, seeking to create a governance framework for equity in emerging technologies in health and medicine. And the last thing I'll say by way of introduction is that this project is part of um, the Black Box Labs, of which uh, Tony is the director at Wesleyan. It's an undergraduate research and training laboratory that offers students training in qualitative research methods, aligned with science and technology studies, and the opportunity to collaborate with faculty on social research, and ultimately a book project, which is incredibly exciting. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Tony Hatch. All right, thank you so much. Um, let me like that. Thank you all for this lovely invitation. Deborah, I'm so grateful for the invitation to come and join you all. Those of you who are here in the room, those of you in the hyperspace zone, I welcome you. Um, the lecture I'm going to deliver today and talk through focuses on uh, an emerging project that I'm developing with students at Wesleyan. The title of that project is called Metabolism Cages for New World Animals, Small and Large. And I will return to this throughout the talk, but I show you a lovely poster designed by one of our designers and artists. Um, and again, I'll, I'll explain this particular image again later in the slide, so I won't belabor it. But this is an, uh, an ongoing collaborative project with students that is culminating in a book length manuscript, um, several pieces of co-produced sculpture we're literally making a metabolism cage uh, that is, I, I would classify it as art. I'll talk about this later too. Um, and also digital scholarship. So we are developing um, an interactive interface that teaches people about metabolism cages and is connected both to the book project and to the sculpture. So this is a project that is trying to connect art, science, politics, culture in a meaningful way. In my talk today, I want to focus on um, the, the concept of metabolic ethics. Now, this isn't my concept. Uh, this is a concept I'm literally borrowing from a happenstance conversation I had with my dear colleague, Hannah Landecker at UCLA. And we having one conversation one day, she's like, Tony, I think there needs to be a metabolic ethics. What would that look like? This is like a couple of years ago. And you know, I think very much with cases, historical and sociological casework, I didn't have a good case in mind through which to think through what a metabolic ethics would even look like. But today, and through this project, I will share some of what I think a metabolic ethics would need to look like to account for really large scale transformations in metabolic life of the animals on the planet. Um, just a very quick overview for the talk. It's in three parts. First, kind of introduction and framing for you. Second, I'm going to kind of target and focus on the particular questions and theoretical frameworks that we bring to bear on the study of metabolism cages. Uh, and in that work, I'll describe um, some of my really, I think my work over the past several years has been focused on tracing 
food and pharmaceuticals as they move through ecosystems and bodies. And so I'll kind of talk about that movement and, and how we understand structurally the flow of food and pharmaceuticals and toxins through animal bodies. One of the uh, highlights of this project is a focus on how the animal-human boundary gets redrawn through metabolism cage research. Talk about that for a moment. And then in part three of the talk, I will walk you through a handful of cases to help you see and visualize um, the kinds of questions that we are raising about, about metabolic ethics. Um, and this will all make sense to you when we get there. I do have one design up here. Um, this is a hand-drawn, hand literally pixel-by-pixel pixel replication and transformation of, of a, a hand-drawn um, uh, lab like notebook from Professor Wilbur Atwater, who was a professor at Wesleyan back in the late 1800s. He was the, the person who discovered the food calorie and, and, and so we'll talk about his research in a minute, but we actually took one of his, his lab had a hand, it was drawn by his daughter, uh, a hand drawn, and it said, you know, chemistry laboratory, well, we took that and we remixed it and we did our own uh, for this. So this project actually starts in 2002. In 2002, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, started a research project it called Metabolic Dominance. Uh, in, in a nod to Deborah's child who likes Marvel, the idea here was that DARPA would, through metabolic dominance, the, would be able to create a super soldier, a Captain America type figure whose metabolism could be manipulated and changed in various ways to make them a more effective soldier, for example. They could go without eating through for a longer period of time or perhaps go without sleep. Maybe they don't need as much water as they needed to, right? The, 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 whether it's respiration, uh, the consumption of water, food, right? They were trying to tinker with the metabolic processes of human beings in order to create a soldier who was more effective, right? The Pentagon's push to program soldiers' brains metabolically dominant soldiers, the real Captain America project. There's not a lot publicly written about the metabolic dominance project, but this is actually the starting point for me for this work. Um, the gentleman who is behind metabolic dominance, his name is Michael Goldblatt. He's an interesting guy. Back in 1990, he got a new job. Uh, he got a job as the, si the chief science and technology officer for the McDonald's Corporation, where he worked for many years. And this is actually a, uh, a puff piece written in the Washington Post by Carol Sugarman, uh, describing uh, Goldblatt's new job, right? And it starts with this kind of really interesting story about him eating a bunch of hamburgers as a kid. And he had a kind of a, a rocket metabolism is what she said. But Sugarman says, again, this is the quote I wanna pull from the story. This is what Goldblatt says. McDonald's is a company where authority and power go to those who seize it. Does he seize it? Sugarman asks. He hesitates, then jokingly asks that the tape recorder be turned off. Then he says, I'd like to think that I have more power than I probably do, but I think it's fair to say that nobody has ever stopped me. You cannot find an image of Mr. Goldblatt's face. So I offer a not so comfortable substitute, Ronald McDonald. That was not literally part of the Washington Post story. That's me just giving you an image of him because that's there's no, you cannot find a picture of this guy. Um, as a child, he was blessed with a rocket metabolism. And this, that, that story of eating a bunch of hamburgers, that's six hamburgers at a stretch as a child, that's a lot of hamburgers to eat at one time. Um, it reminds me of the Hamburglar, that kind of, that, you know, the, who just literally, you see him stealing a plate of hamburgers, right? Um, if you don't know this, McDonald's tried to reboot the Hamburglar recently, 2015. Uh, and so this is the rebooted Hamburglar. Uh, and he was kind of like a, a sexy dad type figure. And again, this is a piece in Time Magazine, of all places, talking about the internet not being able to decide whether the dad is hot or creepy, but he still steals hamburgers. 
So Mr. Goldblatt has been very busy since his time, both at McDonald's and, and I'll come back to DARPA. Um, this is, for example, from his bio at Colorado State University Ventures, which is the kind of translational office for Colorado State's research enterprise where he is on the board. Um, you'll see uh, he's also involved in the cannabis game, but right there at that, he from 1999 to 2003, he was the director of this particular office at DARPA. He held both jobs at the same time for two years in a row. This, this is from his own bio. He literally started at DARPA. He was working at DARPA, had been working at McDonald's, chief, ST, chief science officer at McDonald's, also envisioning this new project called metabolic dominance. And it's this kind of synergy that uh, is entirely speculative because it's we don't really know what was going on, but that's kind of what, what I'm after is, is, is just tracing out some of the, the, pre, the what previewed and what followed metabolic dominance. But there you go, right? He was the director of the Defense Sciences Office. Metabolic dominance um, has had um, consumer led to consumer facing applications. This is not just about changing soldiers' bodies so that they can fight more effectively. Um, there is, for example, a whole range of consumer products called nutraceuticals. Nutribox is one. Uh, this is created by a guy named Jeffrey Wu, who said he wanted to, quote unquote, achieve metabolic dominance through his product, right? So a person would, would buy Nutribox $100 a pop, a pop for a 30 day supply, and you would then take this Nutribox, these are supplements essentially, and you would eat them every day and you would, that would allow you to achieve metabolic dominance. Now in Wu's characterization, this is actually a video, I'm not gonna show it to you. I, I, I both do and don't recommend it. Um, but what I wanna point out here, just as a quick note, is that this is really much, uh, this is very much for Wu about a, 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 metabolic dominance being linked to certain forms of masculinity and about men be, taking Nutribox to achieve, right, a certain kind of do, a dominance. And so his whole whole program is about kind of hyper-masculinist approach to thinking about nutri, nutraceuticals. If you're not into Nutribox, maybe you'll be interested in um, uh, Lumen. And if, if you, I don't know if you've seen this out there in the marketplace, but Lumen is a metabolism cage of sorts. It's actually a, it's actually a calorimeter. Uh, and you, you take this black, you know, hand, it's like my water bottle. You take it and you breathe into it, right? And the device measure, measures your respiration. It does a little bit of fancy science and it kicks out for you um, information that an individual consumer can use to hack their own metabolism, right? Maybe you need a little bit more of this nutrient, maybe you need a little bit more of that, right? It's this technology that one would blow into, you know, to be able to achieve metabolic dominance. You can achieve weight loss, less snacking, you can boost your mood, improve overall health, right? Another location to consider for the spread of metabolic dominance um, in the carceral space. Um, so these are two uh, stories written in both the Chicago Tribune and on a kind of prominent nutraceutical website about how vitamins and nutraceuticals would be used in corrective nutrition, right, for people who are incarcerated. So if you are incarcerated, we can achieve different kinds of psychological, psychosocial, and social improvements in prison life by people, by the prison officials providing nutraceuticals to their prisoners. Um, and there've been studies done both in, the, in Europe and in the US beginning to try to understand it. If the prison system invests in say a nutraceutical, you know, can we see deliverable, achievable results and maybe there was less infractions, fewer fights, better overall health, right? These examples of metabolic dominance are just merely suggestive to kind of put you in a space where you understand the kind of the stakes that are involved. There's one more stop, and that is here, Monsanto. If you were to Google the Monsanto company, 
Monsanto is the largest seed manufacturer and producer in the world. This is a very powerful transnational corporation, right? They do all kinds of stuff. They make Roundup. Um, if you Google Monsanto today, this is what you get. Did you know that Monsanto and Bayer Pharmaceutical have merged? Monsanto and Bayer are now one corporate structure. There's a new corporate ecosystem that's shaping metabolic relations, right? Both on the pharmaceutical side and on the food side. And I'm for 20 years now, I've been trying to see the ways in which these systems converge and come together. Bayer and Monsanto, right? Metabolic dominance is not just a research project at DARPA. I argue, and along with my students, we're arguing metabolic dominance is a, a kind of social power. It's a process. Um, we define it as such. Metabolic dominance is a multi-species process and a form of social power that features a feedback loop between metabolic knowledges, like knowing certain things about how bodies process food, toxins, and drugs, animal confinement in metabolism cages, both small and large, we'll come to this again, and the diverse techno-scientific practices that feed, drug, and poison animals within diverse local niche ecologies, right? Wherever you're positioned in this world, wherever you are, metabolic dominance reaches out and aims to transform your body and the body of multiple species to achieve, to achieve, in Jeffrey Wu's terms, metabolic dominance. Our questions about this form of social power and this process center on how it is designed, how it is engineered, and how it unfolds in different historical and social contexts. Um, for the super dorky in the room, um, the, the, the methodology I'm bringing to this project is like a, it's a Foucauldian genealogy, essentially. It's a uh, thinking through how certain knowledges are, are positioned to be true or not, and how a, a knowledge that is said to be true is inserted into power relationships, into social structure, into governance. The things they say are true, how do they then get implanted into social policy, law, right, school lunches, right, in, re in real terms. So who wages metabolic dominance on whom and with what effects? So our book, the book project is trying to sketch this out in a variety of different ways. And again, we're interested in what forms of knowledge does metabolic dominance both require and engender. So in order to achieve this kind of large scale biomodification, you need to know certain kinds of things about how bodies work and how they interact with ecosystems. But once you have, have started that process, that process generates new knowledges that then have to be brought back into the fold to tighten the screw even, even more so. So it's that reinsertion that I'm really interested in tracking in this project. How do these knowledges become reinserted into science, into capital, and into statecraft? in the furtherance of this kind of, of this form of social power. For example, um, with the work of Wilbur Atwater, which I'll highlight later, we were interested, for example, in tracking how his actual program of research focused on the calorie was implemented in state-run institutions in the early 20th century. So there were literally mental asylums in New York, for example, in, in Minnesota, where they were implementing what Atwater had learned specifically like Atwater's program, we're gonna try that here. I'll, I'll come back to this. But our central argument is fundamentally comparative and it focuses on the scales of metabolic dominance and how different practices of biomanipulation become possible through metabolism cage research. Again, this is small to large from the biochemical to the transnational. And it's that scale, that scaling issue that we track throughout in a comparative way. We compare, as I'll talk about in the next slide, the food and pharmaceutical regimes 
into which metabolic cage research is inserted. And we also compare a whole range of ethical practices of refusal um, that animals who are kept in metabolism cages use to effectively resist their captivity. Um, and we try to situate this dynamic of caging and refusal to be caged in the context of um, a much larger kind of social and political analysis of multi-species mass incarceration and experimentation. So my last book, Silent Cells, again, looked at the use of psychotropic drugs in prisons, and I wanted to understand and know, do prisons use psychotropic drugs to suppress population? And how do we actually know, can, how can we know what they're doing? Um, and so thinking about different captive institutions and captive structures is something I've been um, focused on for quite a while. So there you see our kind of key term, some of our questions and our kind of a preview of our central argument, right? Theoretically, um, in my work, I've been really focused on, again, tracing food and drugs where they go. And drawing from Marxist agrarianists, people who study peasant communities, food systems, they developed an idea of called a, a food regime, right? Which I have developed, I picked up in blood sugar in my analysis of sugar and the kind of food, the structures, the laws, the policies, the trade relationships, the material, the cash, the money, right? That undergirds the flow of food. So the idea of a regime is pretty simple. It involves political and economic structures on the one hand, right? Rules, contracts. And on the other hand, a whole range of techno-scientific practices that scientize eating, that scientize drug taking, right? And they pattern the consumption of food and drugs globally. So you have a system of production and you have a system of consumption. And so thinking about a regime keys you into both systems at the same time, not just how it's made and who made it and where it comes from, but how that is then linked to the practices at, at, the, at the person level, right? And, and the cultural systems that we um, rely on to give meaning to what it means to eat or what it means to take a drug or what it means to be exposed to toxicity. So this concept, this theoretical tracking of food and pharmaceuticals can attract sugar um, in silent cells, tracking uh, psychotropic drugs. Um, in a 2019 book, uh, edited book, edited by Ruha Benjamin, again, thinking about food systems in prisons. It's my favorite essay I've ever written. This essay, Billions Served, again, picking up on this kind of similar McDonald's kind of critique. Um, and looking at prison food regimes, like who, who is in the prison food business? How do those business practices and structures shape the kinds of foods to which prisoners are exposed? And so this work in metabolism cages is like, I've been thinking this more recently as kind of like the third in a trilogy, right? It's like a, it's a third book in a trilogy tracking these food and pharmaceutical regimes and where they intersect. And quite honestly, I didn't know where they, all the ways in which they came together. And this project has been with students, kind of like a painstaking series of revelations, like, oh, they were here, oh, they were there too, oh my goodness, they're here too. And that act of discovery um, has been part of the kind of, that's part of the mantra and the, the mode of Black Box Labs is, let's get in there and figure out, you know, if we have a question, let's start digging. Um, so food and pharmaceutical regimes, very important. The other set of ideas, again, that proved to be important is thinking about how metabolism cages are the site for the establishment and reworking of the animal-human boundary, right? We, of course, are animals, surprise. But metabolism cages have been the site for 34 different, cut, my last slide has this, but there've been at least 34 different species of animals, including humans that of course been kept in metabolism cages of various kinds. I'll give you examples. And it's the kind of the, um, the movement from one species to the other. How does this work with another species? How can we take what we learn with a, a, a mouse and move that to shape how we think about humans? So there's complex multi-species relationships that are have formed vis-a-vis -vis this research. So my colleague, Megan Glick, has written 
really poignantly and beautifully about these kinds of relations in her book, Inf Infrahumanisms, um, as Zakia Jackson as well in Becoming Human, again, thinking about the complex historical, cultural, scientific dimensions of humans, animals, and all of the various kinds of scientific and cultural work that binds them. Ruth Harrison's classic book, Animal Machines, uh, has been on my radar recently. Just as a show of hands of people in the room, who's ever heard of this book, Animal Machines? Mm, mm. It's really, it's something, it's something, isn't it? Oh my goodness. It, this is one of the first critiques of uh, the emerging industrial animal agriculture, particularly in the UK, in Britain. And she is a uh, the, one of my favorite British muck, muckrakers, Rachel Carson. Uh, pardon me, uh, uh, you know, of course, wrote the foreword for this American um, uh, uh, muck, uh, muckraker. And of course, my colleague Lori Gruen and her work, Carceral Logics, thinking about human incarceration and animal captivity in the same moral and philosophical frame. Right. So this is for me moving into animal studies and really thinking about the kind of diverse sets of ideas that they bring to understanding different species relationships to us. All right. So I'm gonna shift a little bit and, and talk about this gentleman, William Osler Abbott, who was a professor at the University of, the University of Pennsylvania back in the early 20th century. Uh, Dr. Abbott um, was perhaps most widely known for co-developing the Miller-Abbott tube, which is shown in its more contemporary version here on the screen. And on the left, you can see the Miller-Abbott tube in a picture of an X-ray. So the idea was Mr. Abbott, Dr. Abbott was trying to devise uh, tube systems that could track, I and mean, he literally would have a patient a, a swallow a tube all the way and all the way intubate, all the way down and to come out the other end. He was trying to, they were, the idea here was to access the interior environment of the body and to deposit food and pharmaceuticals in a very strategic and specific way. So he's again writing at the emergence of basically parental and enteral nutrition um, and how we use tubes to access the body. Um, and one more little one up there. Um, in this really interesting and I think troubling essay that Abbott wrote in 1939 called The Problem of the Professional Guinea Pig, and in this essay, there's a couple of quotations I want to pull out from this and just have you look at this with me, okay? Thinking about metabolic ethics. So he's describing uh, the dynamics of how he gets experimental subjects for his research. He experimented on animals and humans, but humans specifically. He says, were one doing a chronic experiment on a dog, say a long time absorption problem with a three fistula, he would not go to the animal house and pick a wiry young pup with hair trigger nervous system and a desire to fight everything in sight. Obviously, one would pick a big, lazy, overweight bitch that could be counted on to lie and wag her tail while being worked over. And interestingly enough, it is always to the human counterpart of this animal that my clientele dwindles down. Each year, the lean ones seem to have strayed farther from me. The younger ones have better jobs and the newlyweds are having another baby or have moved away. But the easygoing 140 pounders with a streak of gray beginning to show bring their knitting and their children's photographs and pair off in congenial couples so they can gossip, as, gossip the tedium as the tubes go down. They are the ones that stick. And by that he meant they're the ones who stick around to be the subjects of these experiments. So this, this was a, a, a speech that Abbott gave before the Shakara Club, which was this kind of like a pre-medical humanities group of doctors who were interested in literature. So it's written with this kind of dry, not very funny, maybe he got laughs at the time, but again, I wanna point, I'm kind of drawing your attention to the kind of the, the thinking of researchers in this particular moment. Um, but here you go. 
He wrote in, also in this piece, once I attempted to manipulate a tube quickly into Jim's duodenum. Jim was a, he, he experimented almost exclusively on black men uh, in his period of time, uh, because that's how he could kind of, he could find folks. And after, well, I'll tell the story in a little bit, but um, it was, Jim was a brother man who he was trying to do an experiment on. Um, when my eyes were not well accommodated, after a good deal of vigorous palpitation, I suddenly realized that the metal tip which I had been struggling to direct was behind Jim's spinal column. Then my eyes, by that time used to the dim light, detected an unfamiliar contour to the bucket, and it dawned on me that what I had been trying to manipulate with notably small success was a 38 caliber revolver bullet in his erector's spine muscles. When confronted with the evidence, Jim grinned sheepishly and admitted that he'd made a grave error the night before. He'd called on his sweetheart, unaware of the fact that she had seen him that very evening with another girl. Such events led me to wish at times that I could keep my animals, his human beings, in metabolism cages. Right? So Jim basically, he's, he's suggesting that Jim's girlfriend shot him the night before with a 38 caliber bullet and there's Jim you know there for his research and so but he said he wanted to keep his animals in metabolism cages this actually is the passage that sparked my curiosity as to what what in the hell is a metabolism cage I had written a whole book on metabolism and metabolic syndrome but I had never seen this term I asked my biology colleagues they're like I don't even know what that is what is this metabolism cage why would Abbott Who's, you've already seen a little bit of a preview of his kind of thinking. Why would he say he wanted to keep his animals in metabolism cages? Fast forward this conversation. This is a very direct and relevant link to a very serious and contemporary medical problem. And it's shown here. If you or I were to show up at the Johns Hopkins University Hospital, say we've been in a bad accident, and you cannot eat, you have to be intubated, you cannot drink, how do they figure out how much food you need? If you have to be on TPN, like total, total parental nutrition, how do they figure that out? They don't just look at you and kind of size you up and oh, you look like you need 2000 calories, right? This is a very scientific process that comes from this history of, 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 of calorimetry, thinking about, of, of, about how, uh, the body processes energy through its various metabolic processes to keep it simple. So if you're looking there on your left, you see what's called a metabolic cart. This is a contemporary version of a metabolism cage where literally if you could roll in that cart into the ER, you put the patient under this thing, they breathe just like uh, Lumen, they breathe that gives the doctors information that they can then use to set up a particular nutritional program for you, right? So one way to do this is with the machine, with the, in, with the metabolic cart. The other way to do this is with predictive equations. Um, and so I could talk more about this later if you wanted to, but there's a kind of an active debate right now about which of these procedures, which of these te techniques is, is more accurate for identifying how much, um, mem how much food members of different racial groups need, right? Do we need race specific prediction equations, right? So there's a, on the prediction side, they're wondering, you know, do we need specific, um, do we need to standardize our measures for, for race, a, a mode of race correction, if you will. So that's kind of obvious that that's happening, but our project is actually thinking about the machine side of this in, in, a, in a direct way. How do you even get to that point? All right. <clears throat> Again, I feel like I've come through this part of the lecture and you still don't even know what a metabolism cage is. So let's look at a couple. First designed by French and German scientists in the late 1700s, early 1800s. They are spe uh, specifically designed cage structures that control and measure the flow of solid, liquid, and gas matter through into and out of an animal body. It's a, it's a cage that's not just like, it's not just a cage, it's like a sciency cage. And this sciency cage allows for the researcher to both control the food, the matter that goes in, 
and they can track the matter that comes out. They are widely used infrastructure in AD, uh, uh, ADME research, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And they've been deployed in an astonishing array of scientific fields from animal agriculture, zoology and ecology, nuclear medicine, uh, weapons sciences, uh, experiments in space. Oh my gosh, we I found so many cool things. Uh, the first the first of them is by Lavoisier, right? So here you see uh, his ice calorimeter where a guinea pig was put. So you, you have ice in the exterior chamber, you put the guinea pig in the middle, and the, the basic proposition was how long does it take for the, the heat of the guinea pig to melt the ice? Once that ice cools down to room temperature, you can do a little bit of fancy math and you can figure out how much energy the animal burned to change the temperature of the ice, the ice calorimeter. And you can see its diagram there. Um, for what it's worth, if you don't know Lavoisier, a very important figure in the history of science, he was uh, killed, of course, in the reign of terror in the French Revolution. After Lavoisier, there were several, several, I'll just highly give you a couple of highlights. Um, at the University of Munich, there was a really important center for this research uh, for in the late 1800s, early, early 1900s. Carl von Voigt and Max von uh, Pettenkofer's work, 1886 and 1887, you see a dog in what they called a respiration apparatus, right? These are types of metabolism cages. You see the dog with the kind of, with the, um, the, the means by which to measure, right, the gas. Uh, the first, Penotker was the first person to put a human being in a wrist, uh, uh, a calorimeter. Uh, um, it wasn't known as that then, but he was the first person to put one in there, but it wasn't the best design. The best design for a human calorimeter came from Wilbur Atwater. And the Atwater Rosa respiration calorimeter, which was built, the first one, in the basement of one of my campus buildings on my campus in Judd Hall, there on the left, you see a photograph of it as it was built um, in, from 1889. Um, again, the whole idea here is that the calorimeter, the cage, is about measuring the income and outgo, what goes in, what comes out, right? And by tracking what goes in and what comes out of that body, we can know a lot about the body, and about the thing we put in the body. So uh, after they built this calorimeter in the basement of Wesleyan, this was the calorimeter, uh, I'll talk about this in, another, in the next slide, where they were able to compute that, that you know, that 2000 calorie per day, that's, this is where, this is, his experiments were the ones that led to this quote unquote discovery. They produced this discovery, if you will. Um, so successful was this, this device, that the Carnegie Foundation, Andrew Carnegie paid, you know, was the person who put up the money for Atwater to build this device at Wesleyan. There's an important um, to put thread throughout the book of the way that philanthropic organizations and private organizations funded this research. Um, in particular, they had a concern with labor. And so this was about um, figuring out how much energy different kinds of laborers needed and how could we make sure we only give them just enough just enough calories to do the work they need to do for capital and not one drop more. It was about literally devising a scientific apparatus to achieve like minimum standards. I mean, we think about that as kind of a helpful thing, but they were trying to figure out how little can we give you and have you still and have you not die or wither away. Um, again, funded by Department of Agriculture, Carnegie and Wesleyan. Um, it required a bunch of people to operate. Most of the research subjects who were include, who were invited into this, this particular device were Wesleyan faculty and some grad students. Uh, there is one story in the archive, we, we're looking at all of his research papers at Wesleyan, where um, uh, Wesleyan students at the time couldn't drink, right, temperance movement, they couldn't drink. So he got one of the janitors to drink and go in the calorimeter, <laughs> and they're kind of off the books, right? Um, but the experiments ran for from a few hours to several days. There was a telephone inside because you were sealed up. It was airtight. You, it was you know tightly constructed. You, I mean, it was like they're pumping all your air in there. It was like a uh, an exosuit, but in a room, right? An Iron Man. Speaking of ironing, 
uh, in at the, at, uh, at the caliber meter they built in Washington, D.C., they staged, this is staged, this is not an experiment, they staged this poor woman whose name, uh, we're still trying to figure out what her name is. We're trying to identify these people that they had, like who were the, who were the actual animals they put in these cages, um, you know, showing you what, you know, the, the labor that this subject would be doing. So this subject is ironing, this subject is, you know, reading, typing, sitting quietly. So there's a, we're, we're, one of the things we're analyzing in the larger book project, of course, is inequality in various iterations, uh, uh, intersectionally considered. So how race, gender, class, all combine to specify in species, certain kinds of subjects as valuable, others as not. Um, so this is a kind of gender play that, that unfolds, literally kind of playing with gender inside the calorimeter. Again, on the left, not even real study, just staged for the photograph. But it was partly designed, we think, to um, share to the public kind of that the calorimeter wasn't scary, that being in it, like you could kind of do normal things. Um, they had to kind of soften the image. They didn't call it a cage, they call it an apparatus, right? Um, but these are very much cages in my mind. So his work in the calorimeter was so successful and far reaching. Atwater took his show on the road. First place he went, the same year the calorimeter opened was Tuskegee, right? So he goes down to Alabama and partners with Booker T. Washington himself to begin to understand the, and, and extend the cage system out into the field. So with a, one of my students, again, we've been digging into this particular dimension of Atwater's work in a chapter we're calling the field cage, right? Um, and so this is just a couple of, 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 of quotes to give you some sense of how Atwater approached these issues of nutrition and race uh, in, in this work. The Negro problem, he says, like many other sociological problems, represents a disorder in the body politic and a correct diagnosis of the case is needed before we would prescribe a proper remedy. The knowledge of underlying facts is not revealed by political discussion any more than a cure can be found in mere legislation. Right. Atwater was a very progressive guy at the time, actually. So the fact that he was, you know, not saying overtly horribly racist things um, was uh, a testament to um, it seemed pretty racist as it is. We'll, we'll wait till the next one. Um, but again, this was not out of step for the kind of liberal thinking at the time. Right. That there was a the race problem was a Negro problem. Du Bois famously analyzed this and that to understand the Negro problem, one had to engage in a scientific investigation that was separable from political life, right? There was a, a problem for scientists. In his work, Atwater was fascinated with the structures of housing in Alabama. Like, so he took a picture, uh, this is again photograph printed in like their official government report of the Negro carpenter uh, at Tuskegee. This carpenter was a very important figure because this is the guy who helped cajole the other Negroes to get into, into Atwater study. They didn't want to participate in it. But he, this man had built a lovely home for himself and his family. And he was kind of like, you know, one of the shepherd, the stewards of the campus. Let me speed up a little bit here. Um, but it, they went and did this work. Um, the, another image taken from that visit corresponds to the kind of, to the slave cabin, the kind of sharecropper's cabin. And we're thinking about, okay, this is actually kind of this structure operates as a kind of, it's not a cage exactly, but in terms of the food that goes in and what comes out, Atwater saw that structure as like a place, a location from which to extend this kind of thinking, right? And to understand how inequality emerged in this context. So he says, the food of the Negro in the South is one-sided and unbalanced. It contains relatively little of the materials which make blood and muscle and brain and a relatively large amount of those which supply the body with heat and keep it warm and muscular uh, strength for its work. Considering the body as a machine, which was of course is kind of leading theory, right? Uh, the, the food of the Negro lacks material for building and repair and contains a relative excess of fuel. So he's trying to understand these dynamics as they are and kind of, you know, extending his theories about machine bodies, and it didn't quite work. Um, 
for reasons I'll just highlight very quickly here. Um, the, in his, these are called dietaries, these field studies were called dietaries. Okay, Ooh. okay, speed up. Okay, um, that both in, in uh, Chicago, they studied Jewish migrants there, the Negro in Alabama. Communities didn't wanna be part of the studies. They, they were trying to induce them in various ways to participate and they just didn't want some scientists studying them and what they ate, what went in and what went out. Okay. Um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit to give you some other examples, then I'm going to get to the very, get, can I move on to the very end here? Um, some more cages to see this, the scope of change from a 1963 cage for small mammals, for mice, to the super duper high tech, complicated metabolic cage systems that we now have which um, one of the key purchasers of these big systems, strangely, is the VA. The Veterans Administration is a big time purchaser of these systems. And of course, I wanna know why. And there's a whole chapter of the book focused on the, the, the history of, of, of metabolism cage research in the, in the military. Um, for example, this 1943 study, uh, it's not really a report about uh, TNT poisoning. If you worked in the factory where they put, they held all that TNT, bad for, it's bad for your lungs, worse than cheddar, the, the butter flavoring in popcorn, but that's also bad for respiration. Um, so um, they were put together a series of studies where they put, they exposed dogs to aerosol TNT to see what would happen, right? Um, it turned out that the cage structures that they had weren't well designed, so there's all kinds of contamination and cross-contamination. They couldn't quite figure it out, but um, you know, all of the animals that they studied, of course, died um, in this process. But again, TNT poisoning, um, uh, there's a lot of examples. For those who aren't familiar, this, this historically, this is a moment when in the 1950s, there kind of sort of a broad recognition that we can't do this animal work the way we used to do it, that this is causing problems. So new strategies around replacement, reduction, and refinement of animal, of animal research started to emerge. I could go on about this, but I won't. Um, but it's really about uh, a recognition that these experiments were harmful and they produced weird results. Um, it's almost like carcerally inflected results. We need free animals, not caged animals in the experiments, right? This is the idea here. And I could talk more about this. Um, there was work on um, uh, needing to design plexiglass metabolism cages for research on high, that research that involved high magnetic fields, right? They had TNT high magnetic field research from the first plexiglass metabolism cage research here. My favorite study by far, uh, and by, by, by favorite, I mean not my favorite, um, was in 1965, where they, uh, the Lovelace Foundation built a massive research structure to host several animal colonies that live their lives there to study inhaled fissive material, right? They built this massive structure where they did things like this. There's, you know, this was a metabolism room that held 208 dogs, one to a cage, 13 cages to a room, um, 1965. In the 1970s, going, jumping across the Atlantic again at the Nutfield Institute, Nutfield Institute uh, in London, um, really this is kind of where we get the title of our project right design of cages and diet for metabolic studies using small new world primates and so you see here an eight cage structure uh for primates and this is a really fascinating article dr herbert talks about how difficult this is um so our little design here is taking a quote from his piece and we compared the metabolism cage to the standard design of a standard u.s prison cell and those two things are positioned relative to each other, right? The one on the right is a prison cell and the one on the left um, for the metabolism cage. And Herbert says, but it was important that the cage system should not take up a lot of space, but that the animals should have a reasonable amount of room. The Nalgene bottle has a metabolism cage. This was an ad in the journal Science in the early 80s 
Uh, so of course the Nalgene, the really good material for building metabolism cages because it, you know, things don't stick to it. And you can, if that pee, the urine and poop, it all slides through. So uh, this was again, uh, we designed an animation, um, just a GIF animation to represent this Nalgene cage and the insertion of medicines and food and pharmaceuticals and rotten, this is about prisons, rotten food and what comes out the bottom for my students and I, a profit of various kinds. Okay. Holding animals in metabolism cages is not, has not really been good science. Despite the fact that there's been pressure since 50s, 60s, 70s to change the way that this is done, there's really weird stuff still going on. For example, uh, this study showed in, from the mid nineties that you should not hold pregnant rats in metabolism cages because the, the, the babies that are born are super deformed and have problems, right? You shouldn't do it. Pregnant animals should not be housed in them. That means that they have been, right? That standard, 94, um, it's not good. One of the reasons why it's not good is that animals that are social need to be with each other. So there's one, in this one design, this is from 2021, right? To design a, uh, basically an apartment style metabolism cage for monkeys. So not just one monkey in a cage, but a whole group of them in a cage. Yeah, apartments, group housing approach. And you see they would all be in there, but this is a metabolism cage. Also the dogs. So again, a novel approach, to, to make it more humane and less harmful, we'll go from having one dog in our cage over there to two. And so now they're designed such that they can touch each other and interact, right, with each other. Last slide, um, breaking you free. I've shown you lots of examples of cage structures, and I think you have some sense now of the kind of puzzles we're beginning to kind of think through. But we're interested not just in how these systems of confinement work, but kind of how we account for them from an ethical point of view. So as metabolic dominance is waged on populations and ecosystems, we think that a new kind of ethics that tracks these practices um, is needed. One that accounts for multi-species relationships across scales, right? The effects of captivity on organisms and knowledge production, right? To being an animal in a cage and then being studied, like so much of our scientific information comes from that kind of environment. And we have to kind of dis sort that out. Um, even to the point where studies are now involved, literally intentionally naming that we have free subjects, not ones who are captive. This is especially for human beings. Um, and thinking about the structural, political and economic dimensions of movement of food, drugs and toxins through bodies, and this just shows you the 34 or so different animals that have been kept in metabolism cages uh, over time. Um, my favorite probably is the yak, the yak or the seal. There's an underwater metabolism cage as well. So with that, I wanna thank you for your patience and for your time. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Do we have, we have time for a couple of questions, I think? Yeah. Thank you. What a, what an amazing talk. I learned so much. Um, I appreciated the mention of, of the Tuskegee Institute and it reminded me that I had read this book on the secret history of home economics and, and uh, Booker T. Washington's wife was a pioneer in home economics. And I was curious about how the home economics field may or may not have uh, interacted with the, these metabolic studies. This is this is a uh, this is a really good question. We are have are in contact with the archivists at Tuskegee, and are trying to piece together both sides of this conversation. Because as a as a as a as a matter of feminist praxis, it's very interesting to see the ways in which women's labor, intellectual and otherwise, gets effaced and erased in some of this history. So from the women who illustrated all the diagrams to the women who worked in all the kitchens where all the food was made, including, and who organized that structure, including Booker T. Washington's wife, we're, we're kind of looking at this to try to understand what 
what did at, figures like Atwater take away from what they learned when they talked to these, these folks? Um, but the, the home economics question is, is spot on. It's not just home economics, it's institutional feeding. So if there's a, for Atwater, he called it institutional dietetics, like how you feed a large group of people scientifically. And so there's a chapter we're developing called Feedlot that looks at this, at this, this particular problem. It's not defeating a large family, it's feeding a lar much lar like a large family. The, the, there's an analogy to, or an analogous relation to for mass drugging, for drugging lots of people. So there's a chapter in the book that looks at automated pharmacy systems, right? The development of automated pharmacies as a way to drug lots and lots of people effectively and efficiently. And that's a big piece. It's about the efficient, low cost delivery of food and pharmacopoeia to the citizenry, right? So some of that happens at home, but happens in these other institutional contexts where people spend a lot of time, prisons, asylums, hospitals, universities. Yeah. Right, I'm afraid we're out of time. So I have questions for you that I'll ask later. <laughs> so let's thank one more time our speaker.